All righty, folks, I have a special treat for you. I have someone that goes by the handle Fed Guy, uh, Joseph Wang. We are going to take complicated economics and break it down for the every person. Joseph, thank you for being here. Hey, Michael, great to be here. I've watched your show before and I've learned from your all your real wow. estate tips. So appreciate it. Wow, that uh, you you got me blushing a little bit. That doesn't happen very often. So thank you for that. Joseph, do me a favor, introduce the audience, who you are, what you do, your background in a couple of minutes, and we'll get into the meat of the discussion. Yeah. So as you as you noted, right now I a lot of what I do it has to do with macroeconomic research, focusing specifically on the Fed, monetary policy, and what's happening with interest rates. But I wasn't always doing this. I actually began my career in law. And I realized pretty quickly that being a lawyer is a terrible thing to do. It's basically writing term papers for the rest <laughs> of your life. And writing I did term not, papers. You know, I did not want to spend my life chasing commas. So oh, I decided yeah. that I want to do something more interesting. Now, what was more interesting? Well, looking around the world. So back then I graduated school in 2008. Well, what was most interesting to me then what was what was happening in the world? You had right. Uh, the financial markets basically imploding. You have the Fed, quote unquote, printing money. And there was just absolute chaos. And it was so exciting. So I wanted to do something that had to do with the financial markets. I went back to school, studied financial economics, worked as a credit analyst, worked as a, in economic consulting, but ultimately ended up with a job as a trader on the Fed's open markets desk. Wow. So the Fed actually has a trading desk. So that's where they do all their big uh, monetary policy implementations. So when the Fed is doing quantitative easing, when the Fed is you know, doing these emergency lending, it's done at the open markets desk by people like me. And mm -hmm. I was there for a few years and I learned a tremendous amount because when you're there, you're kind of like at the kind of behind the curtain in a sense, because right. when you're at the Fed's open market desk, you... Uh, you have you can have candid conversations with a wide range of people in the markets. So on the outside, let's say you look at the yields going up, yields going down, equities going up, equities going down. Uh, you don't really know what's driving that. But when you're at the Fed's trading desk, you can call uh, a foreign central bank, you can call a big hedge fund, you can call mm -hmm. a big bank, and they'll give you a candid conversation as to what they're they think is happening. Wow. You do that, and you also have a lot of confidential data, so you get a pretty big, pretty good sense as to um, how things work. So I was there for for a number of years, and afterwards, I realized that you know I had learned all there was to learn there, and time to do something for myself. So um, I started my uh, well. First of all, I, I wrote a book called Central Banking One Hundred and One, yeah. which is a bestseller on Amazon that talks about uh, how the financial markets work. But now I help people. Um, basically understand the markets with my blog, fedguy.com, which is a weekly research publication. Yeah, that's awesome. I love what you're doing. Let's kind of uh, show me the book one more time. Cause again, I think people, a lot of people that follow my channel, they love what we talk about economics, but there's so much more there. Central banking 101, Joseph Wang, yep. go get it, show him some love, uh, write a review, do all the good stuff uh, for him here. Um, well, I'd be remiss if we didn't kind of start here. We just had fed day yesterday. Yes. Yeah. Um, What'd you think? A rates. What'd you think of the press conference? What did you think of all of that? Uh, now that you've had twelve hours or so to think about it. Yeah. So, you know, actually, so um, I'm going to guess that most people who watch this channel are interested in interest rates because that's what affects, uh, you know, mortgage rates. You know, yep. Good guess. <laughs> and of course, very good guess. <laughs> and and equities. So. You know, the funny thing about the Fed meeting yesterday was that it was not the biggest driver of interest rates. What was the biggest driver is what was called the quarterly refunding announcement. That's when the U.S. Treasury tells the market how much debt they're going to issue and at what tenors. And this is something that, in my experience, has never happened before. So we seem to be moving towards a world where, you know, when it comes to interest rates, Fed is still important, but there is someone else who is, at the moment, just as important, and that is the U.S. Treasury. Now, here's how I here's how we think about that. So when we're talking about, you know, let's say the 10-year yield, which, as we know, has a big influence on mortgage rates, when we're talking about the 10-year yield, anything, anything in the world is always supply and demand, right? Just like we see in real estate, we're not, we don't have a lot of supply right now. It's keeping prices high. So it's the exact same principle when it comes to U.S. interest rates. So what's been happening over the past, well, okay, the past 
quarter is that in August, when the U.S. so every quarter, the U.S. Treasury gives an announcement telling everyone where I'm going to issue. So how much debt I'm going to issue and what tenors I'm going to issue at. Now, how much debt they issue, that's beyond their control. That's up to Congress. So Congress okay. decides how much money the government spends and what the tax rates are. And the difference is made up by debt issuance. So the U.S. Treasury doesn't have power over how much that they have to issue, but they do have power over what tenors. Now, when you say tenor, time, uh, an average person would think maybe duration. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah. So are they going to are they going to issue? So let's say just for the sake of example, the U.S. government has a deficit of a thousand dollars. Now, how do I finance that? Do I issue ten year debt? Do I issue thirty year debt? Do I issue right. a one month bill? So this is all a financing decision that, mm -hmm. that 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 they have to do. So what happened at the last quarterly refunding in August? was that the U.S. Treasury surprised everyone and they said that, you know, I'm going to be issuing more longer dated debt. Ah. And the market saw that and there was like, holy, holy shit, supply of longer dated debt is increasing. Who's going to buy it? Uh, it turns out there it was difficult to find a lot of buyers for longer dated debt. And that was the big driver of the rise in 10-year yields and longer dated okay. yields for the past quarter. Um now, you know, before I, so that's the supply side. Again, there's always the demand, supply and demand. So if we rewind a little bit, we can see over the past two years, the biggest buyer of treasury debt is the Fed, obviously. The Fed was doing, you know, quantitative easing, buying trillions of treasury securities. The commercial banks were as well. Uh, the commercial banks, you know, had a lot of money they were deploying, but they all stepped out of the market. And so right now we're in this place where we kind of have a vacuum. We're not quite sure. Uh, where the next buyer will come from, but the supply doesn't change because the deficit remains large. So that was that was a time, that was a period of the past couple of months where we were in a limbo and rates trended higher. Um, this time around though, the US Treasury uh, became aware that there's not a lot of buyers for this longer dated debt. Mm. So at their current refunding announcement, they were basically telegraphed that going forward, we're going to issue less longer data debt and more shorter data debt, which it's uh, easier for the market to digest. And once the market heard that, you know, less supply, well, that means prices go up, which is to say in the bond world, yields go lower. And so you saw yields go lower across the curve. And as we're recording this in November 2nd, that that uh, rally continues. Now, I, I believe yeah. this is a temporary reprieve uh, mm. because so the expectations based on current law is that our deficit will be $1.5 to $2 trillion a year, every year, basically forever. So this is a temporary Ouch. reprieve. <laughs> eventually, eventually, um, we're probably going to have, well, we definitely want to have yields go up again. But mm. this this little maneuver that the U.S. Treasury did is going to buy us some time, uh, probably through next November. So through the election. <laughs> yes, I, I do believe that that's... Somewhat politically motivated. I don't have evidence, Shocking. <laughs> but uh, uh, it makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, right? Uh, but, but again, yeah, you're right. I mean, it seemed like last week, it might have been the week before, the 10-year was over five. It, you know, mortgage rates were eight. Investor loans were nine. Small business loans were 11. You know, now they're, yeah. you know, I think four, six, four, six, four, something like that as of today. So, so down significantly. Yeah. Um, so again, if we stay on Fed Day, so again, we didn't get the quarter point. We did get, you know, Powell talking tough, like, hey, we're going to go higher, data dependent, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have shared since you've watched the channel that I think they're done. They're at the terminal rate. Uh, but I also think they're not going to cut all of next year, which would be the longest time. So it'd be about 18 months that they've held rates. I think the current length longest is 11 months. Uh, so you you were you were there you were in in, in you know 2008. Um, how crazy is my opinion? Is it just off the wall? Because anything's possible, but is it totally off the wall? So I I think my sense. So first of all, I'll tell you what's priced into the market. So the market is largely in agreement with you that this is the terminal rate, and they're going to hold it at least for the next uh, several months. Let's say until mid-year next year and then there'll be mm -hmm. cuts in the um third and fourth quarters so right. uh, your view is a little bit more hawkish as we would say uh than, than the market so i think so first of all i think definitely that the terminal rate is reached and the reason i think this is that the fed has been making noises mm -hmm. saying that 
you know, we see the 10 year yield going up a lot. That's tightening financial conditions. That's slowing the economy down. And to some extent, that's going to substitute for rate hikes. So the market has kind of hiked for us. We don't really need to hike as much. So maybe we can stand pat and just see how things go. Now, my personal opinion is that there's actually, I think there's a good chance that the Fed actually cuts uh, maybe in March of next year. Now, okay. that's not connect consensus at all. The consensus is with you, with your view. But I think one thing to keep in mind is that, well, there's a couple things actually. So, you know, the Fed looks at the world through the lens of real interest rates. Right. So what are real interest rates? It's, you know, it's nominal rates minus inflation. Now, I can look at an interest rate and say 5%, but I can't really know if that's high or not unless I know what inflation is. 5% interest rate, but if we have 10% inflation, you know, 5% interest, five is a steal. So we really right. have to take into account inflation to get real rates. Now, inflation is still high, but it's trending lower. So mm -hmm. going to, if, we, if we keep this trajectory next year, we'll have inflation trend lower and real rates unless you cut nominal rates, are going to trend higher. Now, I don't True. think that makes sense, right? We don't want to be raising real rates even as we get inflation under control. That, okay. that doesn't seem to make sense. So I think it would make sense to cut rates just a little bit so that the real rates stay constant. Uh, and that's like that. one thing. The other thing I think is worth thinking about is that, you know, the economy, okay, the U.S. is fine, but globally things are things are not doing well. It's mm -hmm. a big slowdown in China, the slowdown in the UK, slowdown in the Eurozone. I think that's going to feed through and impact uh, the economy in the US. Now, the US is not super connected to the world, but it's still somewhat connected. So maybe inflation could slow uh, faster than expected. But again, we'll see. But yeah, I think, I, think I, I'm, I feel very comfortable saying, though, that this is a terminal rate. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing inside inflation is shelter is still a very large contributor. Uh, shelter is obviously calculated on a rolling 12 month, um, you know, way or whatnot. Um, where do you kind of see shelter inflation maybe in the short term, the next three to four months? Because uh, I, you know, it feels like it's trending one direction, but maybe I'm wrong. Michael, this is real estate. I'm going to have to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> So I will say this though. So by various measures, model, model measures of shelter, uh, the the overwhelming expectation is that it comes gradually down. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I understand, we have a lot of um, also we have a lot of multifamily in the pipeline that's going to come online. So that that seems to increase supply. But on the other hand, we also have mortgage rates very high. So you know, if people can't um, buy, they're going to have to rent. So that seems to have yeah. more demand. So uh, I, I'm not sure how these two play out, but yeah. Uh, to, yeah. Yeah. When I look at the numbers, uh, certainly through the rest of the year, just mathematically speaking, we're taking off some of the largest numbers from last year and putting on smaller numbers. So, Hey, you know, it's going to go down. Uh, I actually have just started to sh share Joseph that I think shelter inflation may sneak up on us. May, June, July of next year, because really what you've said, and we're not, I mean, even on the new construction side, we're really backing off development because 8% rates matter. And I mean, Jerome Powell indicated that yesterday that, you know, real estate's taking it on the chin with 8% rates. Um, so I think one of the sneaky things to watch next year is shelter. It, it certainly will go down the rest of the year, but to your point, I think it might surprise people and come back and be a problem. I think people have models really don't work very well. It's uh, they get surprised pretty frequently. So I, <laughs> that, that, that would not surprise me. Yeah. You know, when they get their financing, is it from a bank or do they go to private lenders? In real estate, a lot, most people will be going to a bank, right? There's a lot there. I would say owner occupants, predominantly banks, as you say, uh, then there are investors, which are probably if residential investors, probably half and half bank versus DSCR lenders. And then obviously there's the commercial side, which is really shut off. The commercial banks, regional banks, they're not lending. Um, you know, we're seeing more and more evidence of funding gaps, aka cash in refis, even for 2018 deals. There was an article just on that, I think, in the real deal yesterday. So yeah, there's a lot of pain out there. Um, I want to flip the script a little bit. You came into this in 2008, which most people will call the GFC. Uh, obviously, since you're on Twitter, 
you know, all about the doom and gloom out there, calling the current environment the GFC squared, because it, it has to be worse than the last time. Uh, I'm curious, as somebody that was on the inside, do you see similarities between now and then? I mean, what do you see from your, your vantage point? Oh, so to, to be clear, I was not at the Fed during the 2008 crisis. I was at, at that time, I was actually working at a law firm. So, okay, um, sorry. I don't think that we have a repeat of the 2008 financial crises. I think that's actually really difficult. So we have to be careful not to be always be fighting the last war. Right. So uh, my sense is that, you know, our own personal experiences color what we how we perceive the present and the future. And for a lot of us, the 2008 financial crises and the Great Recession afterwards it had a big impact on our lives. And mm -hmm. of course, um, we we many we all lived through the 2020 when there was a big crash. So I think the script is always in our minds that you know something's going to blow up, it's going to crash. Now, so with that in mind, I think it's usually uh, usually when we when something happens, we think back and we try to fix it so it so it doesn't happen again. Now, looking at the 2008 financial crisis, that was fundamentally a banking crisis. So mm -hmm. the banks and uh, bank-like entities basically loaded up on a lot of assets that turned out to be worth less than they thought. So there is basically a run. The banking sector was basically insolvent. Now, after that, though, the official sector, so the regulators, took a good look at that and realized, you know, we got to do something to fix this. And so they put in all sorts of rules to make the banks uh, basically very boring businesses. Mm -hmm. And the proof of their success, I think, is 2020, when we had this tremendous crash in the financial markets. But if you but look at the banks, they all did fine. There, there mm -hmm. was basically no scratch on them. They were very well um they, they were very they were well regulated and they, they was fine it was fine yep. now okay so there was a crash earlier this year um but i think i wouldn't call that in the same league as 2008 wow. when it was very much uh you know everything was just going to zero mm -hmm. yeah now when i look at the uh, financial system today i think it's it's pretty clear that if we have a risk of a crash it's that we crash up and i know that sounds crazy but um and I'll, I'll tell you why. So we, the private sector is, is has been very well regulated. We don't have a lot of excess debt. In fact, private sector net worth is a, a household net worth is around all time highs. Yeah, it's a what's, record. Yeah. What's different this time around, though, is that the government is basically printing and spending enormous amounts of money. You know, I think of deficit spending, basically you're printing U.S. Treasury securities to buy something. And mm -hmm. if you really think about it, a U.S. Treasury security is basically money that pays interest. Now, if I, for example, wanted to buy a house, I didn't have cash, but I gave you a million dollars in U.S. Treasuries, I think you would accept that. You know, right? It's just, it's basically a form of purchasing power. It's like money. And now the government is basically on an unsustainable path when it comes to deficit spending. They are printing and printing and spending more. And that, I think, tilts the risks to the upside, whereas we could have uh, I think inflation longer than expected, or at the very least, financial markets go higher than expected. So, I think yeah, I just want—I really want to push on that crash up. Yes. And basically, if I were to dumb dumb it down for the every person, that just means assets. Yes. Go up. Assets go up. Yes. Crash so, up. Yeah. Yep. Well, well, we can. I think some people call it a crack up boom, oh. where basically. You are you are basically um, mismanaging the yeah the I I want it, it's not technically money but mismanaging the the monetary system and mm -hmm. making assets go up. Now we haven't actually fully gone into this yet because at the moment we still have what many would think of as an independent central bank that is pushing right. against what the uh, what Congress is doing, but I don't think that's going to last. Now, actually, just rewind a little bit. Now, remember last year, Chair Powell went to Jackson Hole and he gave a speech. Yeah, eight he minutes. That, I remember. Yeah, it, it was memorable and it was powerful. He's like, yep. "We're gonna basically there will be some pain. I'm gonna hike rates aggressively, and yep. there will be some pain." His mental model, of course, is that interest rates go up, economy goes into recession, and unemployment go up, inflation comes down. Right. And fast forward to today. True to his word, rates went up a lot. 
but then the economy accelerated, all right? Accelerated. Mm -hmm. GDP, print for the last quarter, 4.9%. 4 nine. wow. Uh, it's, you know, <laughs> it's like developing country levels. At yeah. the same time, unemployment rate remains very low. So why? It's because even as he was raising rates, we have a 7% fiscal deficit. The yeah. Congress, the government is pushing against the Fed, who is still at the moment still pushing back. So I think going forward, though, ultimately, ultimately, the Fed is independent within the government, but not of the government. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, I think the yeah. Fed will have to cave to the elected representatives, to the public. And so I'm guessing that they will not be able to uh, be fully independent going forward. And that's when you, I think you didn't really have asset prices continue to, to reflate. We're, we're not there yet, but I think that's the direction that we're heading towards. And yeah. that's more of the risk in, in my view. Yeah, no, I've absolutely started to think about this crash up. I've never, I had, I don't have, I didn't have that term, but you know, one of the things I look at again as the housing guy, right, is when I, when I, when I paint the scary picture for next year, it's essentially a crash up. Existing home supply stays near record lows. New home construction uh, drops. You know, uh, thing go mothballed, pause. So we have even less inventory there. Then, for whatever reason, the Fed is forced to cut. Then banks compete and take their margin from 300 basis points to a more historical 200 basis points. Rates get in the six, and oh my goodness, demand is unlocked, and we have a crash up in real estate prices. That is, that's a legit fear of mine, right? Real estate go up another 10 or 15 percent. Not good. I mean, that just that's you know, it's great if you own it. It's not good long term, in my opinion. The the haves and the have nots get wider and wider. That's a big fear I have. Yeah, it, it is um, basically exacerbating everything, all the trends we've seen over the past um, generation, actually. So uh, it, it's going to be interesting how they think about doing that. I mean, I, I think historically what, what they would do is raise taxes, maybe even a wealth tax. And maybe. I think that's been considered across the world. Uh, not successfully, but, you know, they could have new tools to implement that. That could make it more successful. Well, they're going to have to change the U.S. Constitution if they're going to get a wealth tax passed. But that's, you know, that's a, it's been that's done a before. We, we didn't have been an done income, before. Yeah. We didn't have no, an income right. tax before. Right. We didn't have an income good point. Tax. Good point. Um, good point. <laughs> uh, to your point about mortgage rates, I think one thing I think would be helpful to note is that when, when we look at mortgages, we usually look at them as a spread to 10-year treasury yields. Correct. So there's that spread there. And that spread is historically very, very wide. So even if the 10-year treasury doesn't really do anything, I think the expectation is that over time, that spread could narrow a bit. So we could still have mortgage Agreed. rates come down, even if the treasury yields don't do anything. No, I, I agree. I think a mortgage rate in the six is like six and a half is what unlocks demand, doesn't unlock supply. And again, it means asset values go up, the crash up scenario plays. And again, this goes to the stock market, crypto, Bitcoin. I mean, just, yeah, if, if you run the house uh, that way, it, it the crash up scenario frightens me, frankly. Let's talk about a couple of economic terms that I would love you to kind of relate and why they're important. The first one I think about is M2 money supply. And there's a lot of doomers talking about M2 money supply going negative. It hasn't gone negative since the Great Depression. They don't zoom out and realize what happened the last two years, but they just talk about it going negative the last, whatever it is, six months, nine months, whatever it is. Uh, but let's talk about M M2 money supply. Why should an average person care? What does it mean when doomers say it goes negative? And why may it not be you know, such a terrible thing in current context? Yeah, well, I think you know, doomers going to doom. That's what they do. Yeah, They've been dooming for two do. years. <laughs> They've been dooming for two years. And uh, we're still here. Um, so I think the, the the common art, so M2 at a high level is basically deposits in a bank. It's what people think of as money. Uh, it's money supply. So the common argument, I think, is that, well, money supply is shrinking. That means that, you know, maybe the economy might go into recession because there's, there's less money to spend. I think that really fundamentally misunderstands the idea of money supply and also misunderstands what's happening on a macro level. Now, just a little bit of history. Now, the idea that money supply is a big factor into what happens in the economy is something that's intuitively very appealing, right? So Milton Friedman, who was a very famous economist, had, has a um, memorable quote, you know, uh, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. And back in the 1980s, 
the Fed and many people in the economics establishment took this very seriously. So we had an inflation problem in the 1980s. And so the Fed was like, you know, this must be, have something to do with money supply. So they began to track the money supply. And in fact, for a period of time, they implemented monetary policy by adjusting the supply of money rather than just purely interest rates. In fact, they tried to track money supply. They, they invented, you know, M2, M3, M4, M5. Um, and they did that for several years and realized that it was not working. That doesn't seem to be how the world works. It's a very appealing concept, but it's been tried for so many times to focus on money supply and link that to broader economic variables, and it just doesn't work. And, and I think I can explain in this context today why. So what, what is M2? M2 is basically a deposit, a bank deposit. So when you log into your checking account at the bank, you see that deposit, that, that's, that's counted in M2. Where does that deposit come from? It can actually be created in one of two ways. One, a deposit is created when a bank makes a loan. So uh, this is something really interesting about banking is that when a bank goes and makes a loan, it's not lending you someone else's money. It's actually creating money out of thin air. Banks mm -hmm. create money. That's what they do. And usually, traditionally speaking, when we see, let's see, M2 money supply increasing, uh, it's because banks are lending more. And you can make an argument that, you know, if there's more lending activity, that's bullish for the economy. That That's reasonable. Mm -hmm. But that forgets that there is another person who can also create M2, and that's the central bank. So mm -hmm. when the Fed is creating, is doing quantitative easing, for example, they're you know, buying tremendous amounts of treasury securities. Well, let's look at it from your perspective. I have a treasury security. Okay, it's sitting in my Schwab account, $100,000 in treasuries. I sell that to the Fed, and the Fed takes it and gives me $100,000 in deposits. So there's a few steps between this, but at the end of the day, that's what happens. And in fact, M2 increased, not because of bank lending, but simply because of monetary policy. Now, over the past two years, M2 has increased significantly because the Fed has been buying a lot of assets. Now, if that's the case, we have to think about what does that mean economically? If I have $100,000 in treasuries and I sell that to the Fed, I have $100,000 in cash now, but I also have $100,000 less in U.S. Treasury securities. Does that shape, does that impact my behavior? I don't think it does because my purchasing power doesn't change. I still have the amount of uh, same amount of assets. It's just that, you know, maybe instead of earning a few percent on my treasuries, maybe I earn less on my deposits. Basically, that's going to shape my behavior. Maybe I go and I uh, do investments or something like that, which is what the Fed wants you to do. But it right. doesn't actually impact my overall purchasing power. So that was why M2 increased over the past two years. And now that M2 is decreasing, it's just the Fed doing quantitative tightening and reversing that whole process. So now, instead of having $100,000 of deposits in my shop account, I swap that for treasuries. Yep. I don't think that actually imp imp impacts my um, purchasing power. So I don't really think it impacts my my my, my what I'm doing economically. So I think that that to me that doesn't sound very mm -hmm. um, alarming to see M2 drop because it's dropping simply because of monetary policy. But Joseph, it hasn't yeah. done it since the Great Depression. It has to be a problem. That's that's the story. The doom. Uh, of said. course, but you know, the Fed really hasn't shrank its balance sheet this aggressively ever. Again, so I think of it in terms of purchasing power. If we have less purchasing power in the economy, I think that's bad for, for, for the economy. But the thing is, because the decline in M2 doesn't necessarily track purchasing power anymore, whereas it's because you're basically swapping deposits for yeah. treasury security. So I don't think that narrative makes sense. It could make sense yeah. in a world where, where you don't have the Fed doing anything, but that I, that's not the world we live in. Yeah. What I would ask folks when they think about M2 and they see these scary headlines, you don't even have to zoom out very far. You know, like zoom out to like 10,000 feet. M2 money supply was clearly on a trend for a hundred years. Then we have this once in a lifetime knock on wood event. M2 skyrockets because we test the helicopter money scenario. We give everybody money. Shoots up now, yes, we're going negative, but 
it's you know we're sucking some of the you know money out of the system it's not like i it's, know it's, it's still a huge increase right yeah it's, it's like a, massive what are you guys doing so you basically went on mount everest then you took a step back and you think that yeah. you're on the ground but uh you're still quite quite high yeah you're still at you know whatever it is 15 or eighteen thousand foot you're, you're nowhere even close to being truly negative but doomers got a doom to your point um yeah the other thing I want to talk about, and I actually got this from Danielle DiMartino Booth, so shout out to her. Um, I was um, I was thinking, again, I shared earlier, I don't think the Fed cuts next year. She was in your camp. She actually thought that they could sometime, let's call it summer. But she actually highlighted the more important thing to watch, and again, full credit to her, I did not put this together, is to continue to watch QT. Because in her mind, the Fed could cut, and continue QT, um, QT being a driver as well. What do you think of all that? Well, Daniel's a great analyst, and I agree with what she's saying. So I'll give you a little bit of history on this, actually. So okay. traditionally in the Fed, they have, a, they have some dogma, like any institution, and that is you don't step on the brake and the gas at the same time. Makes perfect right. sense, right? Okay. If I am, I, I don't want to be cutting rates and yet still shrinking the balance sheet. That, that might confuse the market, that doesn't make any sense. So traditionally speaking, they would only do QE when let's say rates are around zero and they're in cutting mode and they would only do QT right, like they are right now uh, and when they're in hiking mode. So that's the tradition. But lately there've been a few members on the, on the FOMC, so the Fed's decision-making body that are, that are saying that, I think we could cut rates and we can keep QT going. Uh, so they're they're thinking about that, and I think they're thinking about that because they want to get the Fed's balance sheet back to um, a, a, a smaller size. Now, what that means is that I think that's going to be put upward pressure on interest rates. Remember back yeah. to our basic supply and demand principle. If the Fed is shrinking their balance sheet, that means that the supply of treasury securities to the private sector is increasing. So um, that that's going to put more pressure on 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 yields on longer dated interest rates. Yeah. So the one of the things, again, shout out to Danielle for that and yourself is uh, we have to watch QT, right? This is or quantitative tightening. Uh, even if, you know, we get the obligatory, here's a quarter point off in the summer, but if QT continues, we may not see the follow through on rates. Um, did I summarize that? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Like we mentioned earlier, uh, higher Longer dated yields can, to some extent, substitute for rate hikes. So if you have QT pushing the 10-year yield higher, maybe you don't need to hike your uh, your Fed funds rate anymore. Yeah. So let's switch over to the consumer. As you know, the consumer makes up somewhere between 68 and 70% of our economy, based on what source you want to read. Uh, I think it's fair to say that the consumer has surprised most analysts, including myself, I called. I, I thought a, a recession would start after SVB's collapse because the consumer would be scared. Clearly, did not happen. Um, why do you think so many folks have been wrong about the consumer? Um, and again, like you said, we just printed four point nine percent GDP. I think there's. I, I think. Yeah. I think there's two reasons. One is that well, wages continue to grow. Let's say wage growth is still say five percent. When you have strong wage growth, people have money to spend. The second one, though, I think is, I think is becoming more important, and that has to do with demographics. Mm -hmm. So I think more and more people, as they retire, they're going into spending mode where they basically just spend down all their ah, savings. Interesting. Okay. So we, I think we also hear a lot that savings rate is really low and so forth, and that that's because the consumer is really stretched. They're just spending all their money; they can't save. It could be some of that, but another, I think, bigger part is that you have boomers retiring and so they're spending down their savings and that's making the savings rate low and that's also sustaining consumer spending now think about the boomers right so guys bought a house for maybe like fifty thousand dollars a few decades yeah. ago now they're like if they're in california they're, they're multi-millionaires and so right they have a lot of wealth to spend well think of the stock market right boomers began investing a few decades ago stock market went to the moon now, that doesn't describe all the boomers. We also have boomers who are in poor financial condition. But as a generation, though, they are very, very wealthy. And they're not working anymore. They're spending all their savings. So for them, they don't care about the job market. They don't care uh, about interest rates. They are just spending down what they've accumulated. And I think as we go forward- Very interesting. I think that could sustain the economy. Um, it's so a, it's, it's the boomer's fault. That's what I hear you say. I'm just kidding. Uh, 
<laughs> not a fault. Well, they're they're keeping no. the <laughs> afloat, right? They're, they're so. keeping the economy afloat. Yeah, I, I was just having some fun. Um, yeah. The other the other thing I would love to hear you about is again, I think in the United States we are very fortunate, if not lucky, to have the thirty year mortgage. Oh right. Gosh, not only have yeah. we seen wages and increase and it's tax deductible. You, I, and, I tell people that from other countries, they can't believe but, it. <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> um, but a lot of folks, unlike the government, frankly, we took a lot of our debt structure and we termed it out for 30 years. You know, the effective interest rate on mortgages is 3.6%. So not only do we have rising wages, but we have fixed expenses, you know, for our largest expense for sure. And, um, yeah, if you have rising wages and fixed expenses, that extra stuff's called discretionary income. Yeah, absolutely. Cash flows have improved. Hey, actually, let me give you this interesting fact. So uh, the thinking, of course, was that you raise interest rates and then, you know, the economy slows down. But so far, what's been happening is raising interest rates has actually uh, increased the interest income uh, of the corporate sector. Yeah. So so uh, you you raise interest rates and, and the corporations are making more money. I was actually looking at the balance sheet of this one corporation. They had $2 billion in total assets of yeah. that Half of it was in money market funds. And where did they get the money from? Well, you know, a couple of years ago, they, they, they issued a green bond at a 0.25% rate. So they're earning, let's say, 5.5% on their money market funds, paying 0.25%. Cost them a quarter. Interest. Yeah, and uh, that's most of their That's profits. a healthy spread. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, that's to, like 20x or something. That's all good. But to your point, yeah, the consumers, same thing. It's really boosting discretionary income for, for the consumers. And um I my mortgage is 2.75% and I feel like a boomer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Again, if you have fixed expenses and rising wages, net net, that's more discretionary income. Most people spend on, on that. So uh, I guess the last thing to talk about, uh, kind of economic wise, is you indicated that you study macro. So why don't we highlight for folks kind of the difference between a macro and micro? Uh, because again, uh, to the every person that it's just words or vocabulary. How do you kind of split that macro micro? So I think of macro as basically just what drives the economy as in with the unit of analysis is the economy as a whole. Mm -hmm. So are we growing as the economy in the US? Uh, what are interest rates like in, in the US? So these are big macro variables, inflation, unemployment rate, GDP, interest rates. These are the unit of analysis is, is basically on a country level. For micro, I think of the unit of analysis more on the individual level. So what are consumers doing or what are even our individual individual companies doing when they set prices? So it's it's just, you know, as the name implies, whether or not it's, it's very high level uh, where the unit of analysis is just, you know, like a country or a region or worldwide or something that the unit of analysis is something smaller. And the methods are a bit different. So in micro, you, you use a lot more math. So I think the microeconomic economists have have more success in understanding the world, uh, modeling behaviors of individual companies and competition and things like that. The macroeconomists uh, are not very successful, actually. <laughs> so if you look at so the Fed hires a, a, you know probably a few hundred macroeconomists and they give projections on the economy. Their projections that they give to themselves are actually confidential, but they get released with a lag. If you go look at that those projections for the past you know, decade or so, you can realize that they are uh, not very good, <laughs> basically always wrong and sometimes by a lot. So macroeconomics yeah. is hard because when you're talking about macro, you're, you're talking about aggregate behavior. You're talking mm -hmm. about politics. You're talking about the things that change over time. Yeah. And, you know, unlike physics or something like that, where if I drop a rock, it falls at 9.8 meters per second square towards the earth today or a thousand years ago here or in London. When you're talking about macro, you're talking about human behavior that right. is, you know, that changes over time. So there are no, the, the relationships change. So you really can't use math. You, use, you always have to be a bit more uh, yeah. circumspect. But, and when you try to use the math, you get bad results, but uh, <laughs> they try anyway. Exactly. <laughs> they try. They're going to keep trying. They're going to keep trying. Uh, I guess kind of wrapping this up, Joseph, uh, you know, if you want to, do you have any thoughts on where we go in 2024, either with interest rates or economy or, any thoughts on where we go in 2024? So I think we have to be careful, like I mentioned. So 
to make sure that we don't color our judgment of the present and the future based on the past. So I think going forward over the next few years, the future will not look like the past. And the big difference has to do with two things. First, it has to do with the politics and culture of, of the government. So if you think back, let's say 20 years ago in Congress, you would have a lot of people who were known as fiscal hawks and they would want a balanced budget. Those guys are all gone. Today, what we have is, you know, I want to spend a lot of money, but I don't, I'm going to disagree on who I spend it on. You can have people who want to spend it on defense, want to spend it on some other corporation, pharmaceutical company or something like that. Or you can have other people who want to spend it on, say, forgiving student loans or childcare and stuff like that. The debate is never about um, how much money to spend, but always about who to spend it on. That is a paradigm shift in how I think the world will work going forward. If we have persistent fiscal deficits, which we do, the bias is going to be for higher inflation and higher asset prices. It also means that it's much more difficult to have severe recessions because the moment we have a severe recession, well, the policymakers, the public already understands the government yeah. can give me money, right? Yeah. Why don't you just give me money? Um, you can't take yeah. that. You can't put that genie back into the bottle. No. Um, so that that's really really bad for the country longer term. Uh, but we we um have to play with the cards that we're dealt with. So going forward, I would expect inflation to be higher, asset prices to be higher, and for there to be, I guess, I it's very difficult for me to see severe recession going forward. Yeah. No. Inflation thing, is a feature, not a yeah. bug. Is something I've said, unfortunately. Oh, I, it's, it looks that way, right? <laughs> um, the second thing that I think is really changing that we haven't seen before is is the demographic aging. Mm -hmm. So for all of history, we've had a growing population. Now that all changed in the 1980s. In the 1980s, we had smaller families, and um, you know that 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 really didn't seem apparent until today where our workforce isn't growing at the same level, that, at the same rate that it used to. Now, there's a very famous economist. His name is um, Goodart, Charles Goodart. And he has a very interesting thesis that I believe is valid. And that is when you have an aging population, that's inflationary. Why is it inflationary? Well, let's imagine for a moment that everyone in the city retires. Okay, they all have savings, they have social security uh, to spend, but who's going to do all the work? So your demand doesn't change. You, these guys, retirees, continue to go to restaurants, go to groceries. Maybe they don't buy fancy cars, but they still you know, have everyday demand. But the supply of goods and services goes to zero when you retire because you're simply not working. So there is that fundamental imbalance between supply and demand. We're going forward. We have a lot of people you know, continue to consume. Demand persistent. Supply, not there because they're not working anymore. And that's really going to change the world in the in the coming years. And I think mm -hmm. that's going to make wages stay high because labor is going to become more scarce. We're already seeing signs of this everywhere, right? We have this big strike at the UAW. We have strikes, uh, Delta, United, just everywhere. It's labor realizing that they have power and that's going yep. to continue. And of course, that's going to make uh, the things that we buy more expensive as well. So again, yeah. I think we have a decade of higher than expected inflation. The world a decade of higher expected inflation. Yeah. Nice. Okay. So so um yep. yeah. And I think that's it, gonna be the future will not look like the past, is what I'm saying. Oh, I, I I love that. Joseph, where can people find you? Where should we send them to follow you? Yeah. So if you're interested in learning about just uh, so I provide weekly updates on what's happening in the financial markets at my YouTube channel at Joseph Wang. If you're interested in learning more about how the financial markets work, check out my book. And if you're interested in, I guess, a bit more sophisticated take on what's happening in the markets, you can check out my weekly subscription service at fedguy.com, where I uh, research, write research on the markets. And of course, Twitter, fedguy12. Guys, do me a favor, send them some love. We got it, uh, almost an hour of this time today to help us out. Joseph, I appreciate you, man. Thank you for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. You got it.